Well, it is the 4th of July weekend, and I suppose it would be somewhat appropriate to talk about the 4th of July. What do you think? So I will. Many years ago, when I was just a youngster, and uh, those of you who know me would say, yes, it's true, it is many years. Between the ages of about 6 and 15, for the first few years, from 6 to 10, I lived in the state of Iowa, and we primarily lived in the country. Of course, when I mention Iowa, that is the country, uh, and so forth. And then from 11 to 15, we lived in the state of Oregon. And I, my folks always celebrated all the holidays, all the major ones. Christmas and Thanksgiving, Memorial Day, and you will write down a list, and the 4th of July. And for the most part, in most of those holidays, we had all of our relatives live within a 30-mile range. Uh, and uh, we would have a feast day. I can still remember the homemade ice cream we used to make. You remember, maybe some of you don't remember, but we uh, basically made our ice cream. And we had these wooden uh, buckets, kind of like, with a handle on them. And we'd have six or seven of those going at a time. And those make about a gallon of ice cream apiece. There was nothing like that kind of ice cream. And the food that we had was unbelievable. We truly knew how to celebrate the holidays. But the 4th of July was different. And you know what? The 4th of July was even better than Christmas to me. And I can't speak for my th three sisters, no brothers, just three sisters, which helps explain my disposition sometimes. But in essence, um, they may have a different opinion, but I enjoyed the 4th of July. Because we had a set itinerary every year. It was the same. If the church had a bulletin, it would be the same bulletin every year, okay? And so the first thing was we'd get up early, we'd have breakfast, and then we'd go to a parade. Now, I wasn't really into parades. My mother was. My dad liked westerns, but mother didn't allow those things on television. She said no shooting in the house. That was one of the rules, uh, and so forth. So we went to the parade. But I was okay because I was looking at the next step. And since we lived in the country, we was near a little town in Iowa for the first four years called Perry. And Perry had a population of about 8,000 people. And uh, so we'd go to have this little parade and so forth, and it lasted about an hour and a half. And then we went over to the carnival. Oh, yeah, there we go. Now we're going to have some fun. Oh, man, the roller coaster. And most people know me as thought, well, why was that enjoyable to you? Because you never get on a roller coaster except with you with friends who sometimes befriend you. I'll get to that story later. But anyway, the, the tilt a whirl and, and the Ferris wheel. And, and then, you know, you have the darts and you hit the balloon. And if you're lucky and not hitting the guy that was standing beside the balloon, you might get a teddy bear. And then we had all kinds of food, especially what we did, cotton candy. Anybody ever had cotton candy? Oh, I see some of you, uh, those who are really big on the health side of the picture, reluctantly raised your right hand. And so I don't know why anybody would eat cotton candy. I mean, really, it's like eating mothballs uh, and so forth, right? My sister loved that. Well, we moved to Oregon in the same agenda, the same itinerary, except for one Fourth of July in 1957, a little town of Hillsboro, Oregon. I said before, the agenda was the same. In essence, what happened is uh, we went to the carnival, uh, to the parade, but this time we drove home had lunch, and then we walked to a place called Shoot Park, which is a large park in Perry, or I should say in, in Hillsborough. And it was so big that we had a roller rink, and then they actually would have a carnival there, and then plenty of picnic tables. And since we were only 16 blocks away, we walked it. My, uh, my older sister was 18, and when you're 18 and young, you have your own agenda. And so she didn't go with us, but my two twin sisters, Marilyn and Carolyn, and my father and father did go. And so we celebrated there at the carnival, and we had some lunch, uh, additional lunch uh, at the picnic tables, and I had a good time. And then uh, my father said, you know what, let's go home and have a light dinner, and then we'll come back for the fireworks. I always loved the fireworks. Now, we left Chute Park, and in order to get home, we had to cross a four-lane highway. And... Um, it was called the Tualatin Valley Highway, and it ran from Portland through Beaverton, through Hillsville, Forest Grove, and then on to the coast. And uh, it was a pretty busy highway. 
And in the middle was kind of a divider and a place where you could walk halfway across and wait and then observe traffic on the other side so you could walk on across. I was walking with my sister Marilyn, one of my twin sisters. Behind us was my other twin sister and my parents. And as we approached the highway, I could hear my mother saying, you know, make sure you look both ways before you go across the highway. And then she said, maybe you better wait for us. I was 12 years old at the time. And my sister was almost 10. Well, we went ahead anyway, and it was fine. We looked both ways, and fine, we made it to the center of the rider. And what happened after that, I really don't know for sure. My sister and I really didn't have any type of conversation that I can figure out that led to the next, next series of events. All of a sudden, she just took off. She just ran across the last two lanes. Now, on that 12 and Valley Highway, if you look to the north, there was a bend in the road. You could not see beyond that bend. And it was less than a quarter of a mile away. If you look south, you could look quite a ways. Unbeknownst to me, or Marilyn, was a young man about 23 years of age with his girlfriend, and they were running, came around that corner at a very high rate of speed. And all I remember was that Marilyn didn't make it. She was hit at somewhere between 60 and 70 miles an hour. The body went straight up in the air, crashed up against the windshield, fell off to the right side of the car. She slid 20 to 30 feet down the road and ended up on a curb. I was stunned. I didn't move a muscle. And all I could hear was a scream of my mother. She had completely lost it, as you could understand. Emotional anxiety doesn't really explain her feelings at the time. My father raced by me because I just stood there. My mother came up right behind him, and, and she was confused, dazed, emotionally distraught, and Dad went to pick her up and said, No, no, don't touch her! And then a young man trying to help her, 19 years old, was working at a gas station right along the curb there. He raced out. And she yelled at him, and she said, why haven't you called an ambulance? Poor guy, he was trying to help, but she had just lost it. And so I came across the road with my other sister, and I looked down at my sister with lacerations all over her body. Her arm was twisted behind her back. She was unconscious, and I'll be honest with you, there was blood all over her. I thought I'd lost her. You know, um, it was a tough time then. And, uh, you know, for a 12-year-old boy, you know, all of a sudden, with all the fun we've had, and I remember when I was at that age, you, know, you look for the good times. That's all you really think about. That's all you really want. I think we all do. And I thought about that, and it was an invitation, I should say, an introduction to knowing that life is not a bowl of cherries. Life can be tough. It can be hard. It can be discouraging. It can take just about everything out of our system. I look in the Bible and I think of Job. And we always go to the story of Job because Job got to the point in his life, this was a Christian man. And he said, I wish I would never have been born. Elijah, after his victory at Mount Carmel, up in a cave and he said, you know, Lord, there's only one of us left. The Lord says, ah, uh, not quite. There's 7,000 others. And then I think of Jesus on the cross and his humanity. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I say this to you today because I don't have to tell you, I'm singing to the choir, that life is tough. And ultimately you're going to experience tragedy. And the question is, what is my purpose in life? You know, there's a book called Stephen Covey. He wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anybody familiar with that book? Edited, uh, actually came out in 1985. I was working at Damon Laboratories. I was a director of marketing there here in Phoenix. And we used it, okay, for all of the management team on how to be more effective. And one thing about what Stephen Covey did is he brought a spiritual element into the content. And in, as he was uh, about the middle of the chapter, 
he says, every individual should have a mission plan. Well, I want to revise that a little bit. Every person has a purpose for living. Has a pur- Whether they know it or not, they have developed a purpose for their life. And by what we believe our purpose for life is, is how we are going to react like what happened to me on that street when my sister was hit by a car. In 1969, there was an artist by the name of Peggy Lee. Anybody heard of Peggy Lee? Well, I am getting older. But uh, Peggy Lee was a famous pop singer, sang some country music, and her popularity carried over two decades. And in 1969, she sang a song that had actually been introduced by two other artists the year before and went nowhere. And the song is called, Is That All There Is? When I heard that song, I was two years out of the military, and I thought, oh, that is a horrible song. It is so dark. I was, I was offended by its lyrics. I'm going to read those to you today, and I want you to think about purpose as you hear the testimony of this individual, because that's who it is. It goes like this, and I'll read it slowly. I remember when I was a little girl, my house caught on fire. I'll never forget the look on my father's face as he gathered me in his arms and he raced through the burning building out on the pavement. And I stood there shivering in my pajamas and I watched my whole world go up in flames. And when it was all over, I said to myself, is that all there is to a fire? If that's all there is, if that's all there is, My friends, let's keep dancing. Let's open up the booze and let's have a ball. And when I was 12 years old, my daddy took me to a circus. It was the greatest show on earth. There were clowns and elephants. There were dancing bears. And a beautiful lady in pink tights flew high above our heads. And I sat there watching, and I had the feeling that something was missing. I don't know what, but when it was over, I said to myself, is that all there is to a circus? Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball. If that's all there is. And then I fell in love was the most wonderful boy in the world. We take long walks by the river. We'll sit for hours gazing into each other's eyes. We were so very much in love. And then one day he went away, and I thought I'd die, but I didn't. And when I didn't, I said to myself, is that all there is to love? Is that all there is? Is that all there is? My friends, if that's all there is, then let's keep on dancing. Let's break out the booze and let's have a ball. If that's all there is. I know what you must be saying to yourselves, the song goes on. It's that the the way she feels about it. Why doesn't it just end it all? Oh, no, not me. I'm not ready for that kind of disappointment. Because I know just as well as I'm standing here talking to you that when that final moment comes and I'm breathing my last breath, I'll be saying to myself, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friends, let's keep on dancing. Let's break out the booze and let's have a ball. If that's all there is. There's a famous famous English proverb that says, eat drink and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. That is the summary of this song. What was this, I'm going to say woman because it was a woman singer, she didn't write the song, but what was her purpose in life? She saw no purpose in life. Everything that life brought meant nothing. Everything that life brought added nothing. Do you know why a lot of people don't come to church anymore? Because they say, you know what? Faith is not relevant. That's what this lady was saying. 
It doesn't do anything for me. It doesn't make me better. It doesn't make me improved. It doesn't make me make more money. It doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. So why go? I appreciate their honesty. But this story of this song, if all, all there is, is also mentioned in the Bible. Did you know that? This eat, drink, and be merry is mentioned four times in the Bible. In the book of Isaiah, we're told a prophet warns the people of Jerusalem that because of their hypocritical attitude, they will be punished. You know what they said? Forget it. Let us drink and be merry. They had no real purpose in life. Life is what you could get out of it. But at the end, like this lady said in the lyrics, you will face the greatest disappointment. Death ends it. It's over. It's done. God said to those people, till your dying day, this sin will not be atoned for. God does not want us to have that attitude because he has a better purpose for us in life. In Luke, the 12th chapter, the 19th verse to the 21st, we read of a farmer who was doing very well. His harvest was great. I mean, he had so much grain coming in, he tore down barns and built new ones. And then in verse 19, it's, he says to himself, I have plenty of grain laid up for many years. I'm going to take life easy. I'm going to eat, and I'm going to be merry. And God said to him, you fool. The very thing that you save for yourself and prepare for yourself, you will lose, because I am taking your life this day. This is how it will be, we're told, with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Simple summary on this story is that the real purpose in life is to be rich toward God. There's no other real purpose. And I understand people if they think that I went to church and I said to myself, is that all there is? Is that all there is? So the question for you and I today is, what is God's purpose for our life? That is our mission. That is our mission plan for the rest of our life. Jesus had this wonderful prayer in John 17. He was about ready to experience Gethsemane. But here's what he prayed, and it's found in verse 3, which is the whole summary of that prayer. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ with whom you have sent. Jesus said, I want relationship with people, and I want intimate relationship. That's your purpose, God's purpose he wants for you and I. That's the whole goal of us being here, to know God. That's the whole goal. That is our objective. And a little later, I'll tell you, we don't want to serve God in the flesh. We want to serve him in the spirit. Amen? There is a dramatic difference. And the first step, Jesus died on the cross, and I will tell you right now, over the last three years, I have had such a great study in the book of Hebrews, the book of Revelation, and I did it in small groups. I have learned to appreciate and respect the cross more than I ever have. Because it means a lot more to me now than it did three years ago. The first step is this. We're told in John chapter 1 verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who even just believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God says, look, if your purpose in life is that you want to know me, I appreciate that, I respect that. But you need to become a part of the family first. You need to be a child of God. And so he makes a promise that if you accept what he did on Calvary for you, he does a lot of things. And one of them is you become a child of God. He says not only become a child, you have the right to become a child of God. That's pretty strong, isn't it? And then when Peter was on Pentecost, and I tell you, we talk about Pentecost, Peter is going through... All of the things that the Jewish people and leaders had done, they had crucified the very Messiah they supposedly were looking for. And they, the Bible says they were pricked at heart. They said, what do we do? What do we do? 
And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. Another gift, along with being in the family. Being in the family means forgiveness. And he goes on to say, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God knows that once we have a saving relationship with Jesus, and you start there, that is the foundation of our faith, to know that we are a child of God. When you are a child of God, you are guaranteed assurance. You are guaranteed eternal life, as long as you are connected with the true source of life. If we don't know that, if we don't have that as our being, we cannot go any further than the Christian experience. Because that is the Christian experience. And then we read it in 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 9. He says this. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. So what's first? He saves us first. He makes sure by promise, like Abraham believed in the covenant, by promise. Even though Abraham made mistakes and God had to keep changing his plans. Bob's making reference to that in Sabbath school today. God adjusts but he will keep his promise. We may not be faithful, faithful all the time, but he is. And when he says it's so, it is so. Isn't that nice? And so it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, he saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything you've done, but because of his own purpose, and because of his own grace, and because of his own love. And this grace was given us through Jesus Christ. Oh, the cross is magnified, is it not? The cross is magnified. George Knight, in his book, End Time Events and the Last Generation, he says this. The center of the gospel is the cross of Christ. Are accepting his sacrifice and his work in our hearts, in our minds. Although unworthy, Although not feeling it, God made you a promise. And he says, you know what? If you accept what I've done for you, you will now be righteous in my sight. Too often as Christians, we keep trying to obtain righteousness when God gives it to us at the very beginning. How can we serve? How can we share if we don't know our destiny? And maybe that's why people are not attracted to our church service. They don't see assurance. They see doubt. They see unhappiness. They see judgmental spirit. See, the Jews were religious people, but they served Jesus in the, in the flesh. I shouldn't say they served him. They served their God in the flesh, just meaning this. Every time we try to make ourselves acceptable God through law, we will lose. We make our acceptable Make ourselves acceptable to God through the promise. As Abraham received the first covenant, by promise. You do not want to be religious in the flesh. Paul talks about that. You get time tonight or today. Take your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2 and read it. What it's like to be a religious person in the flesh. You know what Paul calls it? He says, garbage. It's not worth your time. Our second objective is not only to get to know God, but that we are formed to be part of the family. Uh, the, in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, there are tons of verses. I'm not going to read them all. Although I hope to come to you soon, in Paul writing to Timothy, I am writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you'll know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, that's the people of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of truth. This church is the foundation of truth, sitting on the grace of Christ. So when we don't come to church, when we don't become involved, we are putting aside the foundation of truth. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, you are since you've been justified, you'll have peace with God. And in Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. But he wants us to stay in him. 
And the way we do that is stay connected to life. As Jesus tells us in the 15th chapter of John, stay attached to the vine, right? I'll take care of the fruit. Too many of us are focusing on fruit and not focusing on relationship. That's the difference between worshiping in the flesh and worshiping in the spirit. No wonder God gave us the Holy Spirit. We need it. We need it. We can't survive without it. And so our first objective is to know and love God. That is part of worship. To love our spiritual family is fellowship. And so we're told in verse 10 of Ephesians, chapter 6, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Being part of the church is part of growing and part of holiness. The church is protective to us. It helps us. You know, when we become a member of the church, we choose to join and we get connected with fellow believers. Your decision to accept Jesus is personal, but it's never private. Christian life is not just a, a matter of believing. It's a matter of belonging. It makes no sense for a Christian not to join a church and belong. It make any more sense than a professional football player who practices forever and ever but won't join a team. Or like a famous musician who is very good at whatever instrument they're playing, but they won't join an orchestra or won't belong to the choir. Makes no sense. Jesus tells us, I should say, Paul tells us in the Church of Corinth, some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles. Some of us are slaves and others are free. But God's Spirit baptized each of us and made us part of the body of Christ. Everybody's invited. I don't care what your race is. I don't care what your sex is. I don't care what your economic condition is. I don't care what job you have. It makes no difference. Wouldn't it be nice if we had that in society? Well, that's the society we'll have when Jesus comes. That's the society I want. How about you? When... My wife and I were converted. Carol came from a, a church that uh, was very gospel-driven, an evangelistic church. And she's the one that got me to, as you've heard my story a hundred times, to Youth for Christ and other places when I'd rather to go see Jimmy Stewart and the man who knew too much and so forth. But we ended up going, as love will do, driven to places we normally wouldn't go. And anyway, our story is very simple. It's years after we got married. You know, I, t I told Carol that, you know, when we get married, I'll, I'll start going to church. That never happened at first. And I want to tell you, young people, if you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend who isn't attending, has no interest in spiritual things, and tells you after you get married, he'll commit, you, he'll commit to following you. I will tell you that it probably will not happen. If he won't do it when you're dating, he's not going to do it after you're married. Fortunately, we got a knock on the door one morning, and it was a call quarter. And I'll make this quick. We ended up taking Bible seven months of Bible studies. Are you kidding? Got so, I mean, we had Bible studies for so long that the, the kids started calling the pastor Jesus. That's how long. We were in seven months. Mark knows how it is. He, says, he looks at Chuck and he says, no, that guy takes a while to learn these things. He says, he's slow, but he gets there. It takes time, but it comes. Hill was way ahead of me when it came to the foundation of faith. And so we were baptized. And when we were baptized, we joined a church. That just seemed the natural thing to do. That means we chose a group of believers. And we start watching them. How do Christians act? Ooh, that's a little scary. How many new people do we have, right? But that's what they do. And ultimately, we committed ourselves to the church because the first decision we made was salvation. We were no church when we made that decision. We made it before because we wanted to become a child of God. And then we joined the church. 
And then the second thing when it comes to church is that fellowship is a learning experience. I'll tell you something fresh. I'm listening to our Sabbath school today. My wife was leading out and so forth. And the, and the discussion went back and forth. There were so many good things in there. How do I know that shepherds don't have dogs? Now, you don't get that if you went in class, but we learn all kinds of things there, even something like that. But I gained stuff from that. I gained learning from other people. I don't care if you have a PhD in theology. We learn by sharing with others. When I come to Sabbath school, I don't expect a lecture. I expect a discussion. You get a lecture during the sermon. Sabbath school is meant to study the word. And the reason why many people who have left the church say, religion is not relative to my life is because they don't talk about the issues of life in comparison with the word. There has to be an audience and a plan and a space to do that. Sabbath school is one. Sabbath school is one. You know, back in the early church, we were told that in Acts, I'm going to go run over this because we're getting a little late, and somebody told me that Kim has a cottage cheese loaf in the oven, and it's just burned. That's so I'm late. But uh, that's not true? Oh, okay. But anyway, the situation was this, uh, and I just forgot what I was saying. <laughs> that comes with my age, you know. What can I tell you? What was I talking about? Oh, yes. All right. The sanctuary or the synagogue was where most of the early believers went to church. But the time came when they were no longer welcome. So they met in homes, and they were baptizing people by the hundreds and the thousands. This was Pentecost. Well, those little homes weren't like these 4,000 square foot homes that we see. By the way, mine's not that big. That makes you feel better. But the thing is, is that they had small homes. So all these people were broken up into groups of 10 and 15 and 20. Somebody says, small groups is a 20th century item. No, it's not. It is part of Pentecost. In fact, the reason Pentecost was as successful as it was, and there are many reasons, is because of small groups. I will make you a comment today that I believe is right. If we are not meeting in small groups, we cannot survive. And there's biblical proof behind that. Now, as we said, we've come to church for fellowship, to get to know one another. But we come to learn from one another. It is very important. You know, Paul says, I've learned to be content in all things. What's the key word there? Learned. I've learned to be content. The church is a schoolhouse for the path of righteousness, as we talk about today in our Sabbath school. And number three, not only do we gain rapport with our people, we gain information and we learn as we apply the principles of the Bible to current events. We then think we need to labor with them. The church has a mission. If you believe you've been saved today, if Jesus was to come right now and you could say, I'm ready because I accepted the promise, you have something to tell. You have something to share. You have a testimony to give because you'll see that in your life as you go along. But when Kill and I were converted, were baptized, came into the church, one day they asked me to do a Sabbath school lesson on a health message. And I was still eating hot dogs. I mean, come on. <laughs> you, know, I, uh, you know, I didn't know a lot about those things, but I knew Jesus, at least in a baby-like faith. But they asked me to be involved. And so I did some things that I was capable of doing at the time. And one of them was that uh, we used to get these little reply cards, you know, from the magazines and everything of people requesting Bible study. Remember those? And we'd hand them out, and I said, oh, well, Kill, I'll take a couple. And I think, we're well, giving Bible studies? I could see Kill giving it, but me? You know, we're really uh, dusting the bottom of the pan here, and so forth. But we did. And we learned from that. And we had non Christians, we had Pentecostals, thinking of the pastor, and also other denominations we would study with and so forth. We wanted to be involved. We're Paul told in Ephesians 4.16, from him the whole body is joined and held together by every supporting ligament 
it grows and builds itself in love as each part does its work. So we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. We come into the church among all these believers. We begin to learn and hear and watch and share. And then we become part of the mission of the church, which is telling other people what Jesus does for you. That's all you're asked to do. Personal testimony is worth a lot more than anything. And you may be asked to be a greeter. You know one thing? I think greeting is one of the most important jobs in the church. What do you think? When you walk through that front door and somebody's there to shake your hand and give you a bulletin, that's worth something. If you're a greeter today, you've got a great job. You've got a very important job. And I'll tell you, friends, if you don't see a greeter at the door and you're a member of our church, become a greeter. Meet people. We want them to know Jesus because we don't want them to face the great disappointment on their own. And so let's look at the process again. We're born again. We're receiving eternal life. We have assurance. We have peace. We have no condemnation. How can you have it any better than that? And then Jesus calls us to a life of holiness. And that word sometimes is kind of warped by how people have defined it. And he's really saying is, now I want you to come and be like me. And he said, if you, if you don't, I don't want you focusing on out, outwardly how good you are. I want you to focus on me in the scriptures. And as you study the scriptures, as you have interchange with other believers, as you go out and share with people in the way you might do it, as you participate in small groups, your love for God will grow. And your love for people will too. And your fruit will come. That's what he means by that. And so the last level that God wants us to reach is the gift of love, to love the church, to love his people. You know, there's a story about the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they were, Jesus was having this discussion with the Sadducees. You know, how could you ever be a religious person and not believe in the resurrection? I could never get that. I don't get I would I would not have been a Sadducee. That's just all there is to it. Well, anyway, a Pharisee comes to him. All these Pharisees. Oh. And he said, uh, and he was an attorney, and he says to Jesus, What is the most important law or the most important commandment? What would you have said? You already know the story, so you'll give the correct answer. But I wonder if you didn't know that story. What? How would you answer that? Jesus had answered it this way. He said, we love our, our God, with all our heart, with all our mind, and all our soul, and our neighbor as ourself. He answered it with the say of love, because you see, when you try to be religious in the flesh, your focus is on you and your performance. When you're in the faith, by the Spirit, you are driven by love because of your focus on Him. There is a difference, and it is a big difference. So, number one, our goal and our purpose in life is to know God. And second is we need to be here. We need to belong. We need to have split the chores with the brethren. We all need to have a peace. If the gospel's worth what, it, what we say it is, and we believe it, don't we want to participate in letting other people know? I mean, what about people that I haven't heard? Could be your next door neighbor. And there's a lot of ways to do it. You don't have to get Bible study. Some people are uncomfortable with that. That's fine. Phil and I were first baptized. We went out and were giving signs. That was kind of funny. On, on a Saturday, we buy 100 signs a month. No, we're not so great. We just wanted to do it. And so forth. And we didn't have a problem going door to door. Some people do. That's okay. There's other ways and other avenues to share. And so forth. And so we tell the kids. Now, this is probably not the best thing. They were about 14, and it was in Wisconsin, like 10 below zero. Hey, guess what we're going to do Sabbath afternoon? Everybody's, oh, what? Well, we're going to go about signs. Oh. They didn't go over real well. You know what I mean? It was like everything hit the bottom. And so forth. Didn't understand. And we tried to modify our Sabbath so our children would enjoy the Sabbath and understand it. We were on fire, and you know, I won't mention the church. It was a nice church, and uh, we were so excited. A man came up to us, and he said, that'll, that'll pass. Give it a couple of years. That'll pass? That'll pass? Think about that. What was he telling me? Now, don't get me wrong. 
Well, faith is not by, based upon emotions. Emotions will deceive you. Emotions change at any little incident that happens. You don't, can't trust your feelings. But you can trust a promise. And so God wants us to love the brethren. And how we do that is meeting together, associating together. And going back to small groups as we get ready to close here. In small groups, you can share your burdens. It's harder to do that in a congregation. But in a small group, as you get to know one another, it becomes easier. Communication is easier. And people who rejoice, we can rejoice with them. But most important is we can encourage one another in the world that we live today. We need assistance from the brethren. Is that not true? So God has provided that's the second purpose that he wants for us. That we are active, we are part of the church because we know it's important and critical for us to continue our saving relationship with Jesus. We do not want to disconnect from him. If you're not happy with your performance, you stay connected. He'll take care of it for you. You stay in the Word and you stay in prayer, I will guarantee you that you will change. It may take you a while, but you will change. And at the same time, you know you have the assurance of salvation. Is that not a fabulous message? And so as we close today, I want to tell you something. One of my favorite, I always say this. I said, Chuck, uh, how come your favorite text changes every day? Well, you can answer that, right? Here's the answer to purpose in life. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the strong man boast of his strength. But if any man, if any man wants to boast, let him boast about this. That he knows and he understands who God is. Let us pray. Father, as we come to you to the throne of grace, we are so thankful. Uh, we don't have much to offer, but we accept your promise. You know, there's some today who have not really done that. They don't have the assurance of salvation. We're not asking them, you know, Lord, to check their feelings. But we just accepted what God has said he will do for us. Then, Lord, help us if we are ones that don't participate that much. God loves us. He loves us all. And there's probably all of us have areas that we could improve in on the second purpose, which is loving the brethren. Help us to be there, to interchange with them, to study your word together, belong to a small group where we'll have to work on that as a church, and that we learn to love one another. That is the answer to a world who has lost its love a world who always looks at the bad side rather than the good side. And then we will have a testimony to give that we can boast that we know and understand God. I pray you'll be with us now on this day. Protect each one of us. Bring our pastor and Gina and his family home with him safely. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your weekend. Be safe. <laughs>